Professor Zines, you may be aware that over the past six years I've interviewed a series of eminent scholars with strong Cambridge associations. Most of these have been faculty members and there have been several visiting Arthur Goodhart professors. You've had a long and distinguished career with strong links to Cambridge. You were the Goodhart professor here in 1992 to 1993. It's not possible to do justice to your illustrious career in one interview, so I'm concentrating on aspects that have a Cambridge slant. I wonder if we could begin with your memory of, or memories of the Second World War. You would have been a boy of 16 at the outbreak of the war. Oh, I, actually, I was uh, not yet nine at the outbreak of war. I was born in December 1930. War broke out, of course, in the 3rd of September 1939. I have no memory of actually uh, the war breaking out. I mean, I do have a great memory of the war. But I think being <coughs> like a lot of school boys, <coughs> the uh, way of life was became normal. You know, you didn't have much to compare it with. You were too uh, young, and uh, there were things you couldn't buy that you remembered. You could get lots of lollies and chocolates that were no longer available or not available in uh, the same quantity. My father, my mother died a year after the outbreak of war, indeed exactly a year, 3rd of September 1940. I was uh, nine, nearly ten. And um, I was boarded with people. Uh, my father, who um, was thinking of joining up, he was quite a young man. He was only 22 when I was born. And uh, he sort of jo uh, joined up, but he was a tailor. And they wanted him to manage a factory making military uniforms under the what we'll call manpower regulations. And so he worked in the city in a factory. And... I, most of the time, was with my aunt and uncle and grandmother in one of the outer suburbs, and I'd see him at weekends. But um, I remember my cousins, older than me, getting called up, you know, one was in the Air Force, one was in the Army. And I recall we sent f uh, food parcels to England, known as bundles for Britain, and I got irritated because we would send all this precious chocolate, which we'd only get once a month, and our relatives would say they would like some dripping. <laughs> so for a child, that was a bit strange. We still in chocolate and they were dripping. But I do remember the end of the war, about both the VE Day in May and the end of the VJVP Day, as it was called in those days, uh, with great joy, you know, at school and... We all had to assemble in the assembly hall and all the flags of the United Nations, as the Allied powers were called then. And uh, I remember going into town, because uh, our school, Sydney High, was quite close to the centre of Sydney and watching the milling throngs. But, uh, but I don't have any... Uh, I mean, we didn't suffer very much. It's just that some, there was rationing. But you, and I remember you couldn't buy rice because all the rice went to Asians and uh, all the rice crop. And then once my cousin, who's in the army, came home with two pound rice, and my aunt made a rice pudding, and uh, I thought it was the most delicious thing I've <laughs> ever tasted. <laughs> anyway, I don't really have any significant memories of the war. I don't think. Thank you. Um. Another question that, um, from which I receive a fascinating selection of answers normally is, why did you study law at university? Well, uh, this, <laughs> you might well ask, because it didn't enter my head. At my, I knew no lawyers, my parents knew no lawyers. Law, all the advice or people telling me what I should do, nobody mentioned law. And anyway, I'd finished, when I'd finished school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and uh, I thought, you know, I was thinking, I thought it might be nice to do philosophy. My father, who was a very, uh, shall we say, practical and pragmatic man, said, what do you do with philosophy? And 
with all the arrogance of a 17-year-old. They said, you don't do anything. <laughs> and he didn't think that was a very good idea. Anyway, a friend of the family was a vocational psychologist and my father was going on about my son. He goes down to the beach every morning. We live near the beach. And uh, doesn't know what he wants to do. Anyway, this chap said, well, send him to me. I'll give him some tests. And I said, look, I've had these tests at school. Uh, and uh, my father said, you'll go. I said, all right, I'll go. So anyway, he suggested law. And I thought the treat as a bit of a joke when I came home. But he suggested law. And my mother, father and stepmother said, oh, well, you'll do it, will you? <laughs> so I had an agreement that if I didn't like it, then I could go on to something else. And within a few weeks, I thought it was lovely. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. And we did, I remember it was the first year in those days with Roman law, contract law and constitutional law. And I liked them all and did quite well. Not top notch, but close to it at that time. Um, my first eminent scholar for the archive was Professor Lipstein, and so any reminiscences that you have of him, Professor Sines, will be very valuable. Well, yes, my reminiscences of him are connected with, which I think you're going to go on to, but there's two areas to connect, my connections with Cambridge, my connection with Lipstein, because I, I decided to come to Cambridge just as a matter of curiosity. It was my second sabbatical. I had previously been at London Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and I knew nothing about the college. I knew they had colleges but had no idea it's a complex federal system that uh, uh, they have in Cambridge. So I just wrote to the faculty, said I'd like to come and they said we'll be happy to give you facilities. We can't give you a room but you know when you arrive see the uh, faculty secretary. And they also directed me to the visiting scholars people. So I wrote to them and about accommodation. And uh, I got a flat on the other side of Midsummer Common behind the boathouses there, Pentland's Court. And uh, I uh, went along. It was about the 5th of August. I had taken two months to get to Cambridge because I'd travelled. I mean, you come all the way from Australia and you haven't been to Europe very much, <laughs> you, uh, you travel, so I did. And um, uh, I arrived, and it was a silly time to arrive because early August there is nobody around. And only two people I thought I knew were Stanley de Smith, who had just come over to Cambridge from London, and Glenn Seeley, who was professor of, I think, commercial law? Yes, yes. yes. and he was at Keyes. But I had no connection with the college, I didn't even occur to me. Uh, and I went to into the law library, and which was then in the L, just off the L, next to the L school building, and uh, nobody was there except one young man who was working away, who I was not to know for about another couple of weeks, who happened to be Paul Finn. But uh, yes. he, he kept, later he said, I was watching you, wondering who this chap is, always going to the Australian reports, you <laughs> see. <laughs> and... Uh, I was a, a chap I had been in correspondence with at Melbourne University, was away on uh, taking a holiday, he was on sabbatical too, and I got this because a man came downstairs to look at some of the library material, and it was Kurt Lipster. He, of course, needs to say, was the only member of staff working <laughs> <laughs> in the law library, and uh, he was very charming, he said, no, this fellow... Uh, what is Dave Fagan Bowden? That's right, no, he, he's on holiday, but he should be back soon. That's the first sort of glimpse I had of uh, Lipstein. And uh, in time, I got to know him more and his wife. Uh, and one, after, one evening, he said, You know, uh, goodness, would like to meet you, come down and have a drink. She sat her counsel me. Was it the Cambridgeshire or the Cambridge Council? I, I believe it was Cambridge. Yes, I think it was Cambridge City Council. Yeah. And I did. She was top notch on what was happening in Australian politics, the election of the Whitlam government and so forth. Of course, she was then in the Labour Party before she left later to join the Dem Social Democrats, I think they were. And, um, <clears throat> but Lipstein, uh, I then had, um, 
I went, when I came in 19, um, that was 72, I came again in 1978 when I was at Clare Hall. Oh, I should say in 72, Len Seeley uh, was, was very disturbed that I didn't have a college connection, so he arranged my dining rights at Keyes College, which is what I did had in 72, three. I came back in 78 to Clare Hall, this time in a, <coughs> a more regular way. I had applied for a visiting fellowship and they gave me one. And I, it was on that occasion that I wrote my first edition of my, you might say, my magnum opus, The High Court and the Constitution. And um, I saw Kurt quite a bit. Uh, and I went to some classes. That might have been 72. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to get a little bit confused. My first was 72. I attended Kurt's classes, the first classes on European law. He had had the manuscript of his book. Uh, and I attended with Geoffrey Saw, who was a famous constitutional law professor in Australia, probably the most famous at the time. And we both attended together, occasionally asking him questions, but I th we later thought we shouldn't ask too many. <laughs> After all, there were students there and they were anxious to get on with the course. Um, anyway, I, um, then later when I went to Wolfson, I'll come to how I got there and everything, but uh, I, of course, were quite close, the Lipsteins were quite close, and Gwyneth uh, would say to me, for example, well, we're going to judge the tidy, tidy towns, we've got to find the tidiest town in the region, and would you like to come with us? I said, that would be very nice. It was all supposed to be a secret when you go in to these towns, but of course there was Kurt's huge car, <laughs> which uh, Bentley was that I think a thirty. It was his forty-two S Sidney Bentley. Austin. Hmm? Sidley Austin. Oh, was it? Ah. Yes. Anyway, people would stop and gaze. So we stopped to have a pub lunch, and the uh, publican <laughs> said, oh, "Are you here to judge the tidy towns?" <laughs> <laughs> so some secret. Um, then they came to Australia, I was very pleased they did, to a conference about 85, and they came to Canberra, and we uh, showed them around. Willis was anxious to go to the Botanical Gardens, uh, and I uh, showed him and Kurt around. And then when we got to the War Memorial, which is a, really a war museum, it's, it's probably the best in the world, I think, it's a magnificent... Uh, uh, institution and there was a big picture of a painting of Lloyd George signing the Treaty of Versailles and behind him were the five, four or five Dominion Prime Ministers. Uh, there was Billy Hughes, who was the Australian Smuts from South Africa, I can't remember what, Mackenzie King? Not sure. Anyway, uh, and uh, Kurt said, Oh, I remember that day. <laughs> and I said, oh. <coughs> he said, yes, I was attending my, either my grandmother or my great-grandmother's 80th birthday. I was 10, he said. And somebody came in and said, uh, ah, the peace treaty's been signed. And we were all joyful. But he said we didn't know what was to follow, of course. And uh, I, that's why I was remembered he was born in 1909, because the Peace Treaty was 1919. Yes. Anyway, we'd keep coming, as we kept coming back, we'd always see the lip sign. But of course, this after a while, Gwyneth wasn't well, and we would just go, we'd go around with a bottle of wine or something in the afternoon and have a chat with them. Uh, and uh, then... I remember she, of course, died. I can't remember the year she died. But, uh, it's about 98, I think. Ah, uh, right. Like, yes. Of course, we came in 97. That was the last time. We came in 97 for about six months. Then we came in 2000, mainly to escape the Olympic Games. <laughs> and uh, uh, by then, um, Kurt had somewhat adjusted to uh, 
to being alone. Uh, but he, um, uh, we'd go down and see him, and he, uh, maybe he took me, invited me to Clare College a feast one night. Uh, and I was just amazed that he was still getting around, except one occasion he said, I fell off my bicycle, I don't know why. And I thought, well, you are 94 or something. And, uh, uh, and then he, uh, actually in 97, I remember he said, oh, look, don't, don't leave it to 2000, because I'll be 90. And I said, well, it, is, it troubles me that I'm about to become 70. And he said, oh, when I was 70, I could do anything. I didn't like to tell him I couldn't. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that was my association with with Kurt, and uh, he uh, he. I've always had a very great affection for him, as indeed I think most people did, um, and uh, I became a, a very revered figure, I think, in Cambridge. You did, mm. yes, um, greatly missed mm. as well. Um, Professor Zines, did you get to know Sir David Williams? David Williams was, in fact, my very closest friend in Cambridge. I, to go back to when I arrived, I said to you I knew Seeley and I knew uh, to Smith, but um, David Williams I'd met just briefly in Canberra. He had taken a, a sabbatical for one term in Adelaide, and it was the period when he was leaving Oxford to go to Cambridge. He was at Keble College and he came to uh, Emmanuel College in Cambridge. And he was brought up to Canberra while in that lay, just to, as they do in Australia, come up for two days, give a lecture sort of thing. And I was briefly introduced to him at morning tea. And I remember him saying, and he's never forgotten, never forgotten, he said to me, oh, Oh, he said to us, uh, well, coming over, the, thing, the only thing I didn't like was that people would think we were ten-pound migrants, you see, because in those days, British could come over to Australia for ten pounds, paid by the British and Australian governments, provided they agreed to stay for two years. If they left before two years, they had to pay the full fare back, you see. Anyway, uh, I said, and when they see you going back, they will think you're a whinging pom. <laughs> and whinging pom was used for people who came out as migrants, decided they didn't like it and went home, you see. So uh, in 1972, as I was sitting in the law library, uh, Seely I'd made contact with, uh, and Paul I had met. And then I saw a figure come in, and I thought, that's that chap in Cambridge. David, and I remember his name, oh, David Williams. So I went to him and I said, hello, my name's Leslie Zines. I'm just here for a, a year. And he said, oh, you called me a whinging pom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't know, I quite did. I, anyway, he said, come out and have a cigarette. So we did. And then he invited me to his, he said, I just want to ring Sally and come out and have a lunch on Sunday, which I did. He had another academic there, French fellow, and Bailey, I think his name was, and uh, from then on, a friendship blossomed, uh, and he was my, he did, went out of his way to make me feel at home in Cambridge, you know, I was uh, very grateful to him, and uh, I returned the favour, like when he came to Australia, as he did on a number of occasions, you know, I tried to uh, do the same for him, but... Um, it was a very sad thing. One of my strongest reasons for coming to Cambridge was because he was here. And um, if he was the one, who, I told you I was at Clear Hall in 78. I was coming in 82 and he was the one who persuaded me to come to Wolfson. Uh, he was the president. Uh, he became president in 1980, I think. He had up to then been at Emmanuel College. And uh, I said, well, I, all right. So I said, OK. And, uh, and then I never went anywhere else. Uh, uh, yeah. And when, uh, so 88, 9, when I uh, became good heart, he was, I think, quite responsible. For, I think he put me up as good heart professor. 
uh, sorry, it was in 92, mm -hmm. three, as you mentioned. And, uh, but when I arrived, of course, he was ceasing to be president of Wolfson to become the first executive vice-chancellor of Cambridge. He had been vice-chancellor. Uh, in, in, you know, they used to rotate the heads of colleges, but they weren't executive. Right? You know, they stayed head of their college. But they decided to go on to an executive vice-chancellor, uh, uh, freed of all college responsibilities, and they built a house uh, in uh, is it Latham Road, just off, uh, um, just off, um, uh, oh, ridiculous, uh, Trumpington Road, going off, and um, so. Uh, but nevertheless, I stayed at Wolfson, and a couple of years later, uh, I was made uh, an honorary fellow of Wolfson in '95, I think. And then I came in '97. By then, Sir Anthony Mason was the second Australian good art professor. Uh, and then I came 2000, 2004. And I, this was the longest period away from Cambridge, seven years. But then Judith wasn't well, she had a bad hip and had to have an operation and then I had this uh, cancer operation so that held us all up. And, uh, but I do miss the absence of David Williams in Can Cambridge. Can imagine, yes. And someone else who's mm. greatly missed. I mean, he did a yes. huge amount, as you can imagine, for the faculty. Oh, yes. He was, he was, he was, and he, he was a very, went out of his way to, you know, make you feel at home. Uh, Professor Zines, you've recounted the circumstances um, of your appointment to the Good Heart Professor in 92. Uh, did you teach that year? Yes, I did, yes. In fact, it was usual, usual that in those days, I can only what position is now, uh, for the Good Heart Professor to teach in the uh, uh, LLM program. Um, although I used to hear uh, mutterings about some people who came and usually very old people, they said, well, uh, what was old once, I don't know, <laughs> uh, who didn't do anything. However, I taught uh, a course in comparative federalism, uh, and I, which I took as the basis for the course, uh, United States, Canada, Australia, and when it came to interstate trade, the European community. Uh, and uh, it was, um, I had... I had about 13 or 14 students, and uh, for the first term, you get more because they, they, they're encouraged to go and sit in on other classes, so I would have had about 22, but about 14 sat the exam, and, um, uh, and it was quite a nice little class, I quite enjoyed it. Did you find um, in that time the collegiate system to your liking, the, the, the Cambridge collegiate system? How well, I don't know. I, well. I, I don't know. I have divided views on that. I, in some ways, from the point of view of the academic, I think the best part of it is that you are forced into a position of mixing with people in other disciplines, and I think that's that's the great pleasure to get to know something about what's going on instead of just talking as as the in other universities the tendency to do is to people in your own faculty or in your own discipline. On the other hand, I think it weakens the central uh, aspects of the matter. I think the, see, when they were building the new law building, uh, the, they were, faculty was asked, do you want a room in the building? You know, when they were designing it. And most people said no. They, they'd be working in their college. Well, I think that's a bit unfortunate, that's yes. all I, uh, So that it's, uh, it has uh, its advantages and its disadvantages. I think you're right, and actually one of the previous Good Heart incumbents remarked upon that as uh -huh. well, how mm. it sort of draws the life force, the colleges, mm. away from the faculty. Yes. Um, your time here uh, in Cambridge at the moment um, 
What, what are you working on, Professor Zones? Oh, well, <laughs> it's not all that clear. I start doing something and then I get diverted to something else. I was, I was thinking of looking at the interpretation clauses in the human rights uh, legislation of uh, Britain, a couple of jurisdictions in Australia, Hong Kong and uh, uh, Canada. But I was diverted away from that as like some new cases came out in the High Court and I've really been bringing myself up to date with a view perhaps to writing something and giving a paper on judicial method in constitutional law. And um, I may be proceeding with that. That's, well, that's what I'm looking at at the moment. But, um, and actually, that brings me to... Um, an article in your 80th birthday. Oh, yes. Oh, you got hold of that, did you? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, Professor Lindell and Sir Anthony Mason refer in their article here to your strong and long-held views of the way the High Court should interpret the Constitution. And I wondered if it would be possible for you to today distill the essence of your views on this which has been the main focus of your... Yeah. Your well, I, I, I think in the past there's been too much of a tendency. Australia had a reputation in the, the High Court, 50s, 60s, 70s, of being what you might call legalistic. And uh, Sir, Sir Owen Dixon, who was seen at the time as perhaps our greatest Chief Justice and highly regarded by English and other Commonwealth judges who would refer to him with some veneration, has said that that's the only way for a court to behave, you say, but the only way you could trust the court is if it was <coughs> concentrated in looking only at legal considerations. <coughs> but of course he didn't do that. He, I believe, he pretended to do it. He, uh, and indeed, you can't, because a constitution is loosely weathered, be intended to endure for ages to come. The, uh, the, the language is broad and general, uh, unlike an ordinary act. Uh, but some try to read it as if it were the Water Sewerage and Drainage Act instead of a constitution. And therefore, I, I feel the judges should be more... There's nothing original about this. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, the the uh, Roscoe Pound, uh, the American realists, uh, I mean, who pointed to this, uh, that you should be aware of the choices that judges have, that you can, that once you're in the High Court, or the House of Lords, or the Supreme Court of South Africa, or the United States, it, you can come to several different conclusions, all of which are rational. Uh, and therefore, you should ask, well, why am I going this way rather than that way? And the law itself will not be the deciding factor. You will have to look at questions of social desirability or justice. Uh, in other words, policy and values, it seems to me, are inevitable. Now, I'm not suggesting from that that you don't begin with the text. I don't approve of judges taking it upon themselves to... Uh, say, well, I'm going to work out what's the best solution for this country based on my own political and moral views and then try and uh, stretch the language to fit in. But, but the language itself will not deci usually decide a matter because it won't get to that highest court unless there are two, at least two arguments, so one, one side and the other side. And uh, that, I suppose, is is in a nutshell. In other words, I'm saying that doctrine uh, and principles together with policy and values are all part of the fabric of the law. And of course we know that, that in common law judges quite openly in torts or uh, equity will decide, well, is this desirable that we should extend this notion or should we limit something? And of course they do so on the basis of policy. They might talk about the law. Uh, and indeed, as I say, the law itself does set some limits, but within those limits you have to go to social or value considerations.
and because uh, we don't have a bill of rights, so that uh, makes it easier for judges to pretend they're legalistic. It's hard to do if you've got a bill of rights. Very interesting, Professor Simons. Uh, you mentioned earlier that when you came to Cambridge, you encountered a young man in the Squire Library who turned out to be uh, Justice Finn, and he was re recently interviewed, in fact, about a year ago, mm -hmm. in his role. And one of the things he spoke about was the Australianisation of the common law. Mm. Um, in your opinion, Professor Zions, do you think this is proceeding far and fast enough for the Oh, department? well, uh, yes, I think it is. I mean, I think it's... Uh, see, up till the 1960s, no High Court judge would think of not following the House of Lords' decision, even if it was contrary to an earlier High Court decision. They would follow the House of Lords. The policy behind that, as far as Sir Owen Dixon was concerned, was the desirability of one common law for the whole British Commonwealth. That was, And you didn't expect the British courts to be following the Dominion, so that the High Court should follow the High House. Well, that ended, uh, indeed, it almost broke Dixon's heart, I think, when in a judgment in 1963 or 4, uh, I don't remember the details, now it was a criminal law matter, and uh, he said he, he and the other members of the court could not, in all conscience, follow a House of Lords decision, and that was the first time that had happened from the beginning of the High Court in 1903. Uh, and uh, from then on, uh, English law became more and more, I mean, a matter of interest, but it was treated as more and more a foreign law of, that you can compare with, look at, might learn from, but in the same way as Canadian law or New Zealand law and so forth. Uh, it wasn't treated as special like it was before. Now, that has proceeded. Now, whether, of course, uh, the results have been good is something which uh, I don't know I can uh, comment on because I'm not, uh, not a great common law lawyer. But uh, uh, we have departed a lot, but it would have a lot from Britain, but it would have happened anyway because of the Europeanisation of English law. You see, which we don't, uh, we don't have that influence, and uh, the the courts will often say, "Oh, well, you know, perhaps we should change this common law rule because, in certain circumstances, we have to follow the European rule, and we shouldn't have two different rules in this area, or something like that." Uh, whereas we don't have that problem, um, and uh, therefore we've, and similarly with administrative law and, um, uh, in fact, the interpret recent, in a very recent case, the interpretation of the Charter of Rights and, and Responsibilities of Victoria, uh, Justice Gummow said, well, look, it's no good looking at the English decisions of the Human Rights Act because they're affected by Brussels. And indeed, yes. Lord so-and-so said, you know, we yes. have to obey. But when we he said, well, we're not in that ball game, really. Um, right. Really so if we've got further apart. Although, as I say, if you've got a good English decision based purely on English law, the High Court would be very happy to look at it. So really, Britain's constitutional relationship with Europe has had a, quite a profound effect upon its that is relationship so. with Australia. Yes. And I think that's probably been true of New Zealand, Canada, and uh, I presume South Africa. So, although South Africa, of course, is partly common law and partly, partly yes. uh, Roman Dutch, isn't it? That's right. Mm. Yes. Very interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you one more thing in relation to Justice Finn, which from which we got mm. onto the subject of the EU, and this is about a comment that you had made uh, to the effect that in a 1995 paper that you wrote called The Forgotten Trust, The People and the State, he had misguidedly lured, he had been misguidedly lured into a heresy 
about trust and fiduciary ideas in relation to the people in the state. <laughs> and I, I, I don't asked recall him, saying that, but I, I well, believe that. I, I believe I did. I, I asked him what this heresy was supposed to have been last year, and he said, I should ask you, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because he knew that you were in Cambridge. <laughs> Well, actually, if you look at his article there, he has a reference to it early yeah, in the piece. Here it is, actually. Oh, yes. Okay. I just made a photocopy of it here. Um, there he mentions... Uh, oh, yes, I have yes. reconsidered the heresy into which he <laughs> believes I was misguidedly lured. Yes, well, he was. The, uh, uh, it started, really, uh, when he came here to Cambridge to do a PhD, and he, what he wanted to do was to see if he could find general principles which would govern the duties of fiduciaries in relation to their beneficiaries or principles, and the duties and obligations of officials and governments in relation to the people. And he, just like Einstein's unified field notion. He thought he could find some general princi principles to govern all. He had some tendencies toward natural law, Paul. Um, whether that was due to his Catholic upbringing, I don't know, but he, he found it sort of vaguely appealing. Uh, anyway, he was discouraged from doing such an ambitious thing for his PhD. And he did his PhD purely on fiduciary obligations, and his thesis became a, a book published, I think, by Cambridge University Press, I'm not sure. But nevertheless, it carried over with him, and he would come up with all sorts of equitable notions. Uh, he got interested in public law, and but he remained influenced heavily by these equitable notions. And... Uh, to give you one idea, under our system, if the Commonwealth has power over, say, um, interstate and overseas trade, the courts say, well, it's enough that the law controls the trade. We're not concerned with why uh, the Parliament's doing it, what its policy is, so that it might have a policy of protecting morals by banning pornographic material going uh, into the country or what have you, even though Commonwealth has no power over morals, nevertheless it has power over trade and it can control the trade for whatever reason and pursue its own policies. Well, Paul said no. Well, he, he would think that as in the case of a trust or a power, you sh that it would amount to abuse of power. And I said, but this is ridiculous. You're not talking about a trustee looking after Benjamin. You're talking about a democratically elected parliament, you see. And then he had notions that parliament could only legislate for the good of the people, so that a court would have to see whether, in fact, parliament had uh, uh, was acting uh, in its sort of vague trustee role for the people. Well, as time went on... It's all right. As time went on, uh, he did realise it, it just wouldn't work. I mean, you're just giving incredible power to the courts to decide what's good and evil. <laughs> uh, but he did retain some of those notions. And uh, I was always... Uh, mocking his views and he would come back and I think that's what the reference was about. I, very interesting. I think that it's also mentioned by uh, just yes, oh. yes, in his piece, in his contribution to your uh -huh. 80th volume. Um, I was just rather intrigued to see that because I obviously have been looking at this recently but I had asked um, Justice Finn, the same question oh. a year ago. Oh, this you, in your note you said he said you better yeah, ask Professor actually, Zahn. Um, that's, I haven't actually marked the place. Uh, he does, right. he does anyway, mention it. Yeah. It's quite very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Professor Zahn, one of your research specialities has been 
a constitutional law of the Commonwealth of Australia. And I'd be fascinated to hear your views on what you think the constitutional trajectory of Australia should and will be. I should perhaps uh, uh, say there that I wasn't... Um, that while the, the Constitution of Australia, I suppose, I have written most about, I have been interested in federalism generally. As I mentioned, I gave a course as a good art professor. And in fact, I was in 1988... I was the Smuts lecturer uh, in Cambridge, giving the Commonwealth lectures. You know, their Commonwealth lectures are given under the auspices of the Smuts Memorial Fund. Smuts, as you know, was Chancellor of yes. Cambridge in, uh, when he retired from politics in 1950, or something like that. And um, my uh, the lectures were called, well, I, I call them the original. Constitutional change, the original members of the present Commonwealth, which excluded South Africa because it wasn't in 1988 a member of the Commonwealth. Uh, and I concentrate on Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And um, the book, the lectures came out in a book published by uh, CUP, a small book called uh, Constitutional Change in the Commonwealth, which was a bit too broad, you know what it covered. So I was interested and I covered um, the notion of how the dominions came to be independent without any break. You know, they, they, the dominions like Canada, Australia, New Zealand all think they haven't changed their law. It just sort of happened, you know, in a seamless way rather than we didn't have any moment, as I put it, at midnight, we one flag was raised and another lowered, and, uh, and mid nostalgia and joy, and so forth. I mean, it just happened, and it's all often very difficult to say, well, when did you become independent? And to say, well, we were almost independent here, we are now. Well, I'm not sure what moment it happened, but <coughs> anyway, um, as far as the Commonwealth of Australia is concerned, the aspect which first interested me were the federal aspects, and uh, uh, when I went to Harvard, I was mainly interested in, when I did American Constitution law, in the federal aspects. It's become less interesting, partly because the High Court has proved to be very centralist. It has interpreted Commonwealth powers broadly, and the states aren't guaranteed any specific powers. They are just given the residue. So there's nothing to interpret. Unlike Canada, where you have federal powers and you have provincial powers, and the court has to reconcile the two. But our court says, no, we don't have to reconcile anything. We just, we, oh, the only powers we look at are the federal powers, and anything left over belongs to the states. But uh, that was intended to create a weak central government confined to specific powers. Canada was intended to be a strong central government because in the 1860s they believed that the American Civil War had occurred because there wasn't sufficient power in the central government. So they gave federal powers, provincial powers, and you look at the provincial powers and they look pretty narrow, like taverners licences and uh, although property and civil rights was the killer, they interpreted that very broadly. And then everything left over belonged to the central government, not to the state. But, but as it has turned out, Canada has, is the most decentralised federation, I think, in the world. And Australia is, a, is rather centralised. And so is the United States legally. Uh, the United the, the the United States politically isn't so centralised, but that's not because of the law, anything interpreted by the courts, but because they don't have a um, party political system like ours, you know, with strong discipline, as in Britain and Australia, uh, so that a member of Congress or a senator they think, well, if I'm going to be re-elected, I've got to be seen to be supporting my state in the case of the senator or my district in the case of Congress. So you find 
Democrats are voting against things the President likes and Republicans who are tending towards more liberal views. So that politically you find federalism still a much more of a force um, in uh, America. Whereas in Australia, I think people aren't, except in the, in the smaller and developing states like Western Australia with all its minerals and wealth and Queensland, uh, but somebody in New South Wales or Victoria aren't really, they don't go around saying, you know, uh, we're interested in New South Wales rights or Victorian rights. They think of themselves primarily as Australian. Yes. But the High Court um, not having a bill of rights and pretending to be highly legalistic, certainly since Sir Anthony Mason ceased to be Chief Justice. Uh, has, in fact, become quite activist under a cover of uh, legitimacy. <laughs> and uh, it has uh, implied rights that aren't set out. So that they, for example, uh, we have a provision that says, uh, Section 7 says the... Um, oh, Section 24 says that the House of Representatives shall be directly chosen by the people. And section 7 says the people, uh, the Senate shall consist of persons directly uh, chosen by people of the, each state. Um, now they've taken those words directly chosen to say, ah, so we've got representative government. Now representative government means you've got to have some freedom of speech to discuss political matters and governmental matters. So in 1990, who uh, they discovered freedom of political speech in the Constitution, which we, for the previous 92 years we didn't know we had. <laughs> and similarly, um, they have used the separation of judicial power, and that's not expressly stated, it just says that the judicial power of the Commonwealth is vested in various courts, uh, to say, well, the Commonwealth can't interfere with judici traditional judicial methods. Uh, it could be open courts are required, except in circumstances where we, the High Court, tell you the closed courts are permitted. Um, you've got to allow this, that, and the other. And the state courts, the states don't have any separation of powers. But they say, oh, nevertheless, the Constitution requires these courts, uh, the, uh, requ the Constitution protects the integrity of the courts so that a state court which is, uh, if a state parliament wishes to um, get a state court to act as a sort of subsidiary of the executive government, it will fail. So all these freedoms are coming in. But purely by implication from institutions, uh, representative government and the separation of powers are two obvious ones. Um, so, but the, 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 the Mason period, were you here during Mason's reign? I just missed, ah, actually. Uh, it was regarded as a remarkable uh, period of, of, um, of freewheeling, well, I say freewheeling, that's perhaps a bit unfair, but having regard to policy and value, considerations and value judgment, there was a bit of reaction against that. But as I say from the examples I've given, the court has been, in some respects, quite activist, but all the time emphasising the text and doctrine and so forth. And I think it could be a bit more open. Professor Zion, something that I was wondering about was the your views on the 1975 sacking of Gough Whitlam. Mm. Um, do you think that this was, in retrospect, do you think this was justified? No, I don't. I, in fact, I wrote a... Uh, uh, I remember writing... I remember signing, me and three other constitutional lawyers, a thing against the Senate taking upon itself to refuse supply. Um, the, I believe the governor, I, I'm not saying the Governor-General 
should never have acted. It seemed to me that that's the point of the Crown. You get to the, a stage where the country can't carry on and the only thing to do is to go to the people to get them to decide. And the only person who can do that is the Governor General by getting somebody to advise him to have an election, which is what he did. But I think he, he moved much too early. The political argy-bargy was still going on and the country had not come to a standstill and there were suggestions that some of the senators on the uh, opposition side were uh, getting very worried and thought uh, that uh, the Senate should pass the appropriation bill. And you only needed about two of them to, to get it through. And uh, the uh, moving when he did uh, resulted in a great split in the community. Now, it wasn't long-lasting, as I some thought it might have been, but it did last for many years. The Governor-General, who stayed on for about two or three years, uh, was often booed, uh, instead of being a symbol you know, of national unity, uh, he was a symbol of division. And um, the Labour uh, Members of Parliament would never attend any function at Government House or anything the Governor-General uh, might have. Uh, put on, you know, lunch or dinner. They just wouldn't wouldn't come and wouldn't even have anything to do with him. And all this was pretty unfortunate. Um, and Fraser, who in some ways is a very really good man, uh, who became Prime Minister, he was very much tainted. It looked like naked ambition. Uh, and he didn't care what happened to the institutions because up till then, uh, it there was, if it, I thought there was a convention, but some said no, it wasn't a convention, but there certainly had been a practice of the Senate not uh, throwing out a whole, whole bolus an appropriation or supply bill. Uh, now, the Senate would always say it's not like the House of Lords because it's an elected body, which is true. Uh, but it is the, pri the House of Representatives is the one that decides who's going to be the government. And uh, and it's the Prime Minister who decides, with the approval of the Queen or the Governor General, uh, when an election is to be. It seems to me, it seemed to me right in the beginning that you can't have a situation where uh, the, the Senate can decide to throw out a government because at that moment it looks like if there's an election the people might be in favour of the opposition, because that's what it amounts to, the opposition and the government. And I was against it, and I'm still against it. <laughs> and But fortunately, it hasn't arisen in all those years. It hasn't arisen since. And uh, one thing I'm sure of is that no Governor-General in future would act so precipitately uh, as... Um, did Kerr, Sir John Kerr, and uh, John Kerr unfortunately uh, got a very bad reputation because of that. In other respects, he, he did good things as a judge and, uh, uh, and was uh, a very uh, reasonably popular up to that stage. Um, he had been Chief Justice of New South Wales before he was Governor General. The Queen, uh, he, he said he was trying to uh, protect the Queen and all that sort of thing. But it's um, uh, it was an awkward position because it could have... Um, see, the point was, the Governor-General can dismiss the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister can get to the Queen to dismiss the Governor-General, so that this creates a rather unholy situation. And when, after Fraser... After Whit Kerr dismissed Whitlam and called on uh, Fraser to form a uh, temporary government until the election, uh, caretaker government, 
uh, and also to advise the Governor-General to have an election. Uh, straight after that, there had been a, uh, a resolution in the House of Representatives of no confidence in Fraser, you see. <laughs> now, uh, the Speaker then went to Government House with this, um, this resolution of no confidence. But in the meantime, he was told to wait in the sitting room, and in the meantime, the Governor General dissolved <laughs> the House of Representatives. <laughs> and, uh, but was, and so he then went to the Queen uh, and said, you know, this was, an un, this was not a good thing for the Governor General to do. And uh, the reply was that, uh, as we understand it, he asked as the Official Secretary that uh, all these powers are in the hands of the Governor General. So the, the Queen, in effect, uh, separated herself further from uh, Australian affairs by saying that although the Governor General is her representative, uh, the understanding is the Constitution gives these powers to the Governor General and she can't interfere or override them. So the Queen now only has, as far well as the federal government is concerned, one power, it seems to me, and that is to appoint the Governor General on the advice of the Prime Minister or dismiss the Governor General on the advice of the Prime Minister. And um, all the powers belong to the Governor General. And the same thing is true now of the states by virtue of the Australia Act of 1986. But um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I, they, they will be, there are moves toward a republic. And I think uh, Australia will become a republic, but nobody's terribly excited about it. I mean, I'm what, I'm what you might call an unenthusiastic Republican. <laughs> I, if we had a referendum uh, on whether to become a republic, as we did in 1998, I'd probably vote yes. But I don't really care very much. You know, it's not, the country's not going to be affected one way or the other. And I'm very anxious that the president of a republic of Australia uh, not feel he has so much popular appeal uh, that he can override the Prime Minister. Uh, you know, uh, now, of course, with an unelected head of state, there are limits to what a, uh, what a head, head of state can do. But um, anyway, that remains in the future. Well, all that remains for me is to thank you so much Thank you. for a fascinating account. I'm extremely grateful to, to you and looking forward very much to incorporating this valuable material into our archive. Thank you, Professor Thank Science. You.